theme of the lesson tonight is a baby never named. A, a baby never named. I was talking to uh, a couple of the men this morning after the service, and it's amazing how many times you read something, you go over something, and yet the Bible is... Um, there's always more we can get from the Bible and even the historical part of what we're reading. The Bible lesson that we have tonight is regarding the baby that was born to David and Bathsheba. And what I never really understood was that this baby, well, I mean, I understood this part of it, but this baby died on day number seven. And in, and in the Jewish home, a baby was circumcised, a boy anyway, of course, was circumcised and given a name on day eight. And so I never really put that together, that this particular baby here in 2 Samuel 12 um, was never given a name, at least basing it on the way that the, Jew, the Jewish home would have followed. Um, the Bible speaks, we're going to read here in our text in just a moment, the Bible speaks of David as being a man after God's own heart. The Bible speaks of David as being the sweet psalmist of Israel. David killed a, killed a giant guy when he was just a young man by the name of Goliath. David was a great king, 40 years, but David had a sinful flesh just like you have and just like I have. And so we're in our, we're in our Bibles there in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare, unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? And so this is kind of the end of the story of David and his sin with Bathsheba. And one of the, one of the things that came out of it was this. Many other things came out of it. But again, just as we see in David, who he had you know, a lot of many great things about him, we understand how how powerful the flesh can be. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The word lust means desire. I think we know tonight, I'm pretty sure we all know that the flesh has great desires. And, and many times those desires are contrary to what God says in his word. It doesn't matter what title we hold, if we hold a title or whatever, our pedigree doesn't matter. The flesh can really bring about great destruction. And so when we walk in the flesh... What does the Bible say? Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. In other words, if I'm going to follow the flesh, then I'm not going to do the things that I should do. The only way to do the things that I should do, or the things that are honoring to God, biblically, is to follow and be walking in the spirit talking about the Spirit of God. Well, on this particular day, we're going to look at it in David's life, um, we see clearly that 
it ended in great disaster. Now, I don't know anyone that says, you know what, I'm living my life so that it'll end in a disaster. In fact, I'm striving every day to live my life so that at some point, it's a, it's a disaster. And I don't think anyone would set out to do that. The only way to accomplish that is to make sure that the beginning, to strive that the beginning and every place in between is sown in wisdom, is sown with discretion, is sown in walking in the Spirit. Because it's kind of like that little, it's maybe a cartoon, and, but I think it really does happen in real life. But you know the cartoon where the, the snowball at the top of the mountain is just this little piece of snow and it starts to go down the mountain and by the time it's at the bottom of the mountain, it's this huge big ball of snow and it's, you know, you've seen it on a cartoon and it's funny, it's just a cartoon. But I think that probably does happen in, in real life with an avalanche or something like that. And everything in its path, Everything in the path of that boulder, that big snowball, just kind of gets rolled up in it. And, and sadly, that's the, the way sin is. So I would, I would encourage us tonight, all of us, including the one speaking right now, if there's any sin, and no matter how big the snowball is, it, let's stop the snowball right where it's at. And, and let's... As we learned this morning, let's get the cleansing that we need, 1 John 1, 7, 1 John 1, 9 as well, and, and let's stop that. Because the sooner we say, as soon as we, sooner that we stop the snowball of sin, I know that doesn't relate when it's warm out, but as soon as we stop that snowball, the better, the sooner the better. Because here's the thing, there's no way that you and I are going to be able to control that thing when it, gets out of, when it gets out of control. And that's exactly what happened here in our Bible lesson. So what do we see in the outline? If you, have your, if you have the notes there and you want to follow along and write these in, I would encourage you to do that. Otherwise, just listen carefully. Maybe God has something for us tonight, each and every one of us. I believe he does. Number one, we find a slight disobedience. The key, I think, there is the word slight. I'm not asking for a raise of hands, but I know that I'm sure all of us have thought something like this. It's not that bad. Here's what it is. It's not that bad. Or we might even ask a question like this. What's wrong with it? You know, I think we ought to, I think a, a wiser question to ask and maybe to teach your young people in your home is how about what's right with it not what's wrong with it but what's right with it but look at second samuel chapter number 11 and let's kind of go back and back in time it says and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to what second samuel 11 1 when kings go forth to what battle don't forget that word Kings at this time of the this time, David is the king of Israel. And it says very specifically right here that it's a time that kings are supposed to be in battle. And it says that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Great. I mean, victory, right? They have victory. But notice what it says at the last, the last statement. But David did what? He what? He tarried. Yeah, that means he stayed behind. David did not go to battle. David was supposed to go to battle. Because it was the time when kings go forth to battle. So this is a very slight, just the slightest, I mean, Maybe he was tired. Maybe I don't know, but that's not where he was supposed to be. He was not supposed to be at home. At this time, he was supposed to be leading the people in battle. Letter A, we see a deserved idleness. A deserved idleness. Get this, 
David had won 21 straight victories. Think about that. I mean, if an NHL team wins 21 games in a row, that's pretty good. If an NBA team wins 21, I mean, you could think about every sports team. You could think about everything. 21 in a row. David was victorious 21 straight times. Man, it's time for a break. <laughs> it's time for a break. No, that's not, it's not time for a break. If it's, if it's the time for kings to go to war, the, the, the place David needed to be was where God had appointed him to be. And in this case, it was in the battle, not at home. 21 victories in a row. Yeah, he probably thought, man, I'm tired. I got I to gotta take a break. Doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to rest. But this was a slight disobedience. Notice what it says in Proverbs 15, 19. Proverbs 15, 19, the way of the slothful man is an hedge of thorns. God warns us against idleness. Now again, David was a warrior, warrior king. But again, God's word says it very specifically. He was to go forth to battle. So I think we look at this tonight, not necessarily on the physical side of things, but on the spiritual side of things. The moment we think we can take a break spiritually. I can tell you right now, you are living on the edge. Because there's no one that can take a break spiritually and not feel the effects of it. No one. That, that may be reading our Bible, that may be praying, that may be studying God's word. It may be being involved in the church. I don't know what it means tonight specifically for you, but we've got to beware, beware. When we start to think it's time to take a break, I'm talking about spiritually. Letter A, a deserved idleness. Letter B, a devil's invitation. A devil's invitation. So David is not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be in battle, but he's at home. So David's guard is down. David's relaxing. Uh, David is uh, just taking it easy. Again, there's always time for this, but this wasn't the time for David. And so his guard is down. And let me tell you right now, as soon as my guard comes down spiritually, Satan is ready to pounce. The Bible says, neither give place to the devil. And that word place is actually just talking about this little sliver He's not waiting for us to open up the back doors like they are tonight. Praise the Lord for the air that can come in. He's not looking for the double doors to be opened up. He's looking for just a little place. And as soon as he has a little place, he's going to pounce. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me. He hates you. The reason God, the devil hates you is because you were created in the image of God. And by the way, God loves you. And anything that is, reminds the devil of God, he hates it. So you remind the devil of God. You're created in God's image. Therefore, the devil is all about destruction. So David's guard is down. It's just, he's prime right now for the devil. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before departure before a fall be very careful at the at, at a time of relaxing i'm talking about a spiritual really when we even when we're taking time off boy i know i know no one would say we can take a week off from god's word we can't take a vacation take time off but don't take time off from god's word it's it's dangerous Dangerous. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, slight disobedience. Number two, a scorned discernment. A scorned discernment. 
What had David already done? Many people believe that David had already written some of the Psalms at this point. Some people believe, well, we know for sure that David had already played his harp and King Saul's aggression went from, uh, you know, 10,000 down to very low. David had already killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. Wow, what a resume. I think we could say confidently that David knew God. He had a relationship with God, a special relationship with God. No question about it. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when he is, he is not where he's supposed to be, all of a sudden, and I, you know what? I've, 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 had these, I've had these times in my life, maybe not exactly like David, but I've had these times in my life where all of a sudden, it just comes at a, at a moment that all of our discernment is just out the window. And that's where we find David, right here. His discernment is gone. Notice what it says in Proverbs 27, 12. Maybe it's in the notes there. If not, maybe we want to turn to it. Proverbs 27, 12. It says, a prudent man foreseeth. You know what that word means? In a sense, he can see it coming. And a prudent man can see evil coming, and so what does a prudent man do? He doesn't keep going that direction. He can see, if I keep going this way, it's not going to be good. The Bible goes on to say, there in that verse, and hideth himself. So he recognizes, the prudent man recognizes, this is not the way I should be going. I'm, I'm hiding myself from this. I'm getting away from this temptation, if you will. But the simple pass on. And what does it say about the simple? They pass on and they are what? What? Punished. Yeah. Sadly, David went from being great and mighty king to being a very simple man, all because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, and all of a sudden, he's now faced with this temptation, and instead of being what he's supposed to be, letter A, there is the look. A look. You see it there in your notes. A look. 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. Most of us know this story, but if it's the first time that you're reading it, whether it's the first time or the hundredth time, I'm trusting that the God that you're letting the Lord show you something in your own life as a warning, maybe as a reminder. I don't know what you need, but I know I need something. And it came to pass in an eventide, verse 2, so he's not in battle, so at eventide, he arises from his bed and he walks upon the roof of his house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to what? Look upon That one look, that one long look brought us to what we read earlier, the baby died in seven days. Because sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Not necessarily physical, but it does bring forth physical death. I was talking to someone, I think it was today, and I basically said that, you know, all of this stuff that comes into my life and other people's life, it's as a result of sin. Sin always brings forth death. I'm so glad that we have a Savior, though, that gives us life. So we don't have to live in this death mode all the time. We can have life. And walking with Jesus is life. Walking with the Lord is life. Yes, even in the midst of death all around us, and I'm not talking about physical death, but death all around us, we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm thankful for that. But notice a look. The Bible says she was beautiful to look upon. If Satan can get us to look, if Satan can get us to look, 
he is on the way to defeating us. Whether it is this kind of a look that a man should never look at a woman except his wife, or it's any other kind of look, Satan is on his way to defeating us. He's just wanting to get the look. Notice the visual component in the Bible, several places that talk about the look. All right, maybe you've thought of one already. All the way back to in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? Genesis chapter 3, we find the look. And when the woman saw the tree, and when the woman saw the tree, she looked at it. She looked at it and saw that it was good for fruit. Why would God take this from me? I mean, this is good looking fruit. And it was pleasant to the eyes, and we all know where that ended up. How about Joshua chapter 7? Joshua chapter 7 is talking about a man by the name of Achan. When, the, when, the, when Israel went into the, uh, to the promised land, they went into Jericho. Jericho, that fortified city. And God did a great miracle in Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down, right? Right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. I won't sing that black spiritual song for you, but it's a beautiful song. But unfortunately, someone did not listen to the instructions that they were given. His name is Achan. And the Bible says in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 21, when I saw, this is his testimony now, when I saw the spoils, when I saw them, it was a, a Babylonian garment. I saw 200 shekels of silver. I saw a wedge of gold. And then he says, uh, uh, 50 shekels of weight. Then I coveted them. This is Achan saying, he admitting what he had done. But it all came back to what he saw. David saw her. Eve saw the fruit. Achan saw the goods. And then Judges chapter 14 I, um, yeah, Brother Mark was talking about Samson this morning in prayer. <laughs> Judges chapter 14, verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath, and what happened? He saw a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. So again, the look. Secondly, though, it wasn't just a look for David. Let her be, we have a lust. A lust. A look doesn't have to turn to lust, but many times a look will turn to lust, a desire. Now, we don't know this for sure. We weren't there, but I think we can probably surmise that because of other things that took place, David did not look at her and turn away immediately. And I don't think we need to go into all of that because you can tell what happened. We'll read it in a moment. Unfortunately, David's look led to something that he should have never been thinking about another man's wife. That's a message in itself, isn't it? Just because someone is in my path that is immodestly dressed does not mean I have to look so long that that look is going to lead to lust. This is the time of year, guys, where your head has to be on a swivel. Okay, that means it's got to turn left and right really quick. I hope, you, I hope you discipline yourself and live by that. Because all it takes is a little. And you, if the Bible is very clear, Jesus said if you've lusted after a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Well, David committed adultery in his heart, but then he committed it physically as well. The look led to lust. Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Psalm 119.37, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in the way. I wrote earlier, and I skipped it, but we were talking about a scornful discernment. I wrote down this, uh, these questions to ask myself, 
as we're thinking about or as we're getting to a place and we're trying to be prudent, where will this decision take me? You know, when, when we're in the moment, nobody thinks about that. David didn't think about that. Uh, where, what are the potential consequences of what I'm going to do? When we've looked and we've lusted and we've whatever, and this isn't just men and women necessarily in that way, but it doesn't matter what it is, when we've got to that place in our life, unfortunately, discernment has already been tossed out the window, and we're not thinking about, okay, what is this going to do in my home? What is this going to do in my job? What is this going to do for the name of Christ, which is the most important thing we ought to ask? Sadly, the discernment is gone. And that's exactly what happened with David, because then, let her see, all of a sudden, there's a license. A license. In other words, now David is so bold about sin. He thinks he can, he has a right. Wow. He's bold about it. I mean, he even, look at, look at the text, 2 Samuel eleven four. 4. David sent messengers. He wasn't hiding a thing. You think those messengers knew what was going on? Of course they did. So it's not just a look and a lust anymore. Now it's, hey, go get her. And he's the king. He's got the boldness now to just step up and say, okay, I'm going to do this. It doesn't matter. Why? Because he's not, he's not discerning anymore. Okay, prudence is gone, discernment is gone, and now it's just, the devil's just going in for the kill. David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for, he, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. Sinful thoughts lead to sinful actions and lead to undesirable consequences. Sinful thoughts can lead to sinful actions, which lead to undesirable consequences. If David had only cast down the first thought, think about it. You know, something that we do when we read the Bible is we ought to be able to look at it and say, okay, I mean, it's not, we're not just running all over David tonight. Thankfully, Psalm 51 is in your Bible, and I hope, I don't remember if we talk about it later on. I think we will, but, you know, but it's, what can I learn? If I would only have, okay, if David would have only done this, so it's not just pick on David, it's okay, take that and apply it to my life. If I would just stop it and ask God, casting down imaginations, Second Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing into captivity every thought. This is not of God. Help, God, help me right now. Right now, God, I need your help. Because what I'm thinking about is not good. It's not pure. It's not clean. It's not of you. God, help me right now. You think God's going to say, no, you're on your own. No, God's going to help you. God's going to help me. But unfortunately, David did not do that. David could have done that. Because notice... Okay, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, or 2 Samuel, let's go back to our text, 2 Samuel 11. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman. Look what it says in verse 3. And one said, this is kind of like the megaphone of the Holy Spirit right here. And one said to David, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife? Hello, David, she's married. And even if she wasn't, hello, David, you're married. This was God's way of saying, don't do this. The wife of Uriah. The Hittite and David ignored it. <laughs> no answer. We don't even see an answer. He just sent messengers and said, bring her to me. He scorned the discernment of the Holy Spirit that was trying, he was trying to give him. 
Wow, a slight disobedience, a scorn discernment. Number three, a shameful discovery. A shameful discovery. Now, I know in my notes it says David's private sin, but I'm not correcting the notes necessarily, although these you know, aren't necessarily inspired, but I don't think, I mean, it was somewhat private, but it wasn't completely private. Because everybody, whoever those messengers were, they knew what was going on. But David's sin ended in personal pain and public shame. Look at verse 5 of the text. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Letter A, we find the choices, the choices. We look at God's creation. Tonight, man has been given the opportunity to choose. Wow. You know what? That's the love of God. The love of God is seen in the fact that you and I have the will to choose. God wants my decision to love him to be my choice, not programmed in. That's not love. But unfortunately, I also have, because of that, I have an opportunity to choose to go against God and God's love. And he will allow me to do that. He will allow you to do that. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Moses writes, therefore choose life. I say, I, 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 I say tonight to us, I, I let God's word speak to us tonight. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So the words of Moses are profitable for us tonight. And we could apply that verse to our life. I set before you good and evil. I set before you uh, the things that are listed there. Deuteronomy 30, verse number 19. Uh, 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 life and death, blessing and cursing. And like we could hear Moses from heaven tonight saying to us as individuals, choose life. I don't say that in any way, shape, or form to talk down to anyone here tonight at all. I'm just trying to say that it's, it's, it's burden. It, it, I, I'm burdened about my own personal walk and your personal walk and, and all of the family of God and those that are without the family of God tonight even for sure as well. But we have a choice to make. Choose life. The first kind of life we must choose is eternal life. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You, becoming a Christian is not forced on anyone. It is a choice. Have you made that choice? Choose life. Letter A, the choices. Letter B, the consequences. The consequences, the choices are ours, the consequences are not. David chose to commit adultery. He did not choose for the baby to die on day seven. In my Bible reading this morning, I was reading, uh, if you're following along with one of the reading plans, I've been, we've been reading about Absalom. Absalom, boy, I tell you. Also a son of David. And again, I don't want to get too far into that, but I think part of that comes back to the decisions here. But anyway, the consequences. For the wages of sin is death. Number four, a shadowed deceit. A shadowed deceit. The natural response of man when he sins is to try to cover it up. Remember what they did in, in Genesis chapter 3. They tried to cover it up. All of a sudden they realized they were naked because they had sinned. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together to try to cover it up. I'm not trying to be funny, but they, they tried to cover it up in their own way. But that wasn't God's way. There's a beautiful picture there, by the way, though. If you go back to the Garden of Eden and you read about it, mankind's way was through 
the, the, um, the vines, if you will, or whatever, the leaves, if you will. In, in other words, there was no blood involved in mankind's way of covering it up. But what was God's way of covering it up in the Garden of Eden? It's the very first picture that the blood of Christ cleanseth us from all sin is seen right there in the Garden of Eden because God said, no, that's not the way to cover it up. The way to cover it up are these animal skins. Here, put these on. I don't think you're going to be able to skin an animal too well without killing it. Skinning it. Not talking about shaving its fur off. I'm talking about skinning it. And so I believe that that was, that was a picture of the shed blood that would come, that would cover the sins of all mankind eventually, uh, but, uh, but man tries to cover it up his own way. Letter A, letter A is a luring. L-U-R-I-N-G. Now, if you've never read this story, this is absolutely mind-boggling. 2 Samuel eleven six. And down to verse 13. So I'm not going to read that text, but I'm going to say that what David decided to do was David decided to bring Uriah off the battlefield. Where was Uriah supposed to be? On the battlefield. He was a very important man in the army, fighting for the people, but fighting for the king. And David says, okay, I got a plan. I'm going to bring him back. I'm going to let him, you know, spend the night with his wife. And, you know, then, you know, what's going to happen is that they're just going to think the baby is... You know, there's no, there's no uh, test that can be done back in this day. And so, you know, it, everything's going to be great. It's going to be fine. You read the text, Uriah's got more, uh, 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 more um, honor in his pinky finger than David has in his whole body at this time. He refuses to go and spend a, an evening with his wife, and he sleeps outside. No, I'm not doing that. He basically disobeyed the king out of the honor of his position and said, no, I'm not doing that. David tries again and gets him drunk. He still sleeps outside. So now let her be, this is the most, I, I remember preaching about this years ago. An amazing thing happens. Let her be is a letter. A letter. I don't know if Uriah knew what was in that letter. I have no idea. But what David put in that letter, verses 14 to 18, 14 to 15, we can read those quickly. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, 2 Samuel eleven fourteen. 14, now verse 15. And he wrote in the letter saying, set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him. In other words, Put him out on the front lines and then move back from him and leave him there by himself. That he may die. And that's exactly what happened. Uriah carried that letter that was sealing his own death. He carried that letter to Joab. Joab read it, followed the king's orders. So now... The slight disobedience has gone a long way now, hasn't it? I'm just going to not go to battle, even though I know this is a time when kings are supposed to be to battle, but I'm not going to do that. I, 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 I'm going to just lie here and lay here. There's no way David would discern that letter that he would write to send to Uriah with Uriah to Joab. There's no way he could have discerned that. And that's exactly the way the devil works. You, you and I, when we get in the midst of this thing of just, of just letting our flesh lead us, and we're all guilty of it, okay? This isn't pick on David night, but I'm hoping that God is helping you and helping me to discern some things in our life right now that we can stop wherever it's at, wherever the snowball is. Remember that we can stop the snowball with God's help and say, okay, we're crushing up the snowball tonight. It's not going any further down the hill. We've got to get some Bible dynamite. We've got to get some Holy Ghost dynamite, and we're going to blow that snowball up, and it's not rolling down the hill anymore. Because you can't do it by yourself. But you can do it with the power of God and God will help you. Letter, or number five, a sobering directive. A sobering directive. Letter A, a murder. 
So now we've got murder in all of this. Second Samuel eleven sixteen, and it came to pass when Joab heard, observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. Wow. So Uriah is a valiant man. Not much valiant about David right now. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell, verse 17, some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. This is what we would call from the book of Proverbs, shed, the shedding of innocent blood. And that's one of the things that the Lord hates. Letter B, we have a marriage. I think David's scheming is just continuing on. Okay, now I've got Uriah out of the way. So now I can just get married. Everything will be fine. Verse 27. Unfortunately, David was blinded to several facts. Potentially, maybe he was thinking this. Notice at the end of verse 27 says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. There's no way this baby could have been anyone but David's. Sobering directive. Number six, a statement delivered. And the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, even if everybody else, except for those messengers, even if everybody else thought, oh, okay, David's marrying Bathsheba now, wow. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You know, we can pull, as, they, as we say, we can pull the wool over everybody's eyes, but we can't pull it over the Lord. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord go over all the earth, beholding the evil and the good. And he's got 20-20 vision. Finally, a story is told, letter A, a powerful story. Finally, God, or I shouldn't say finally, now God sends the prophet Nathan to David. And, 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 and uh, in verse 12, chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, verses 1 to 6, he tells him a story. He tells him a story of a man who had many flocks and another man who had one ewe lamb. So here's a man with just all kinds of sheep, flocks. And here's one man who has one, one lamb. He tells him a story and David is listening. And he tells David that this man loved this one ewe lamb so much that he fed him from his own table. He drank from his own cup. He held him in his bosom, verse 3. He was like a child to this man. Verse 4, there came a traveler unto the rich man. The rich man who had an entire flock. Instead, the rich man took the poor man's lamb, verse 4, and dressed it for the man that was coming to him. I mean, you kind of can get the picture of what Nathan is explaining. And as far as I can tell, Nate, David still is clueless. Because now he's fired up. He's angry now. He's not even thinking about the whole thing that's going on. He's thinking about this, this uh, parable. And he, he's more concerned about this you lamb than he is about what he's done. Sadly. Notice what it says in verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to Nathan, This man that hath done this thing shall surely die. This man is going, we will kill this man. Not only that, this man 
before he dies, I guess, shall restore the lamb fourfold. Verse number six. It's, it's kind of like the story that Jesus told, or excuse me, the sermon that Jesus preached in Matthew chapter seven when he talked about the moat and the beam. You remember that in Matthew chapter seven? Verse number three, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Webster's Dictionary defines the 1828 version, uh, defines a mote as a small particle, anything proverbially small, a spot. It defines beam as the largest or principal piece in a building that lies across the walls and serves to support the principal rafters. David was looking, David had this huge beam in his eye. But he was only focused on this little moat. Let her be a piercing sword. Piercing sword. After David says what he says, Nathan says to David four words. Verse 7, 2 Samuel 12, thou art the man. And like the Bible says of itself, it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like all of a sudden, the sword of, of Nathan's words, thou art the man, went right to the heart of David. Jeremiah says, is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Finally, David is honest. And notice what he says in verse number 13 of the text. I have sinned against the Lord. By the way, it's not covered in our lesson. But this was one year. One year. Can you imagine? One year of David on the throne as the king with this on his conscience. One year before this chat takes place. David would pen Psalm 51, verses 1 to 4, as a psalm of confession in this hour. Lastly, number seven, a sudden death. A sudden death. The consequences of David's sin were not his choice. 2 Samuel 12, 14, Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Praise God for forgiveness, but forgiveness does not always remove the consequence for our sin. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 speak of how God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. Letter A, there's a numb condition. A numb condition. Obviously, David is de devastated by the judgment of God, as anyone would be. He even fasts and prays, hoping that God would spare his son. No one can say anything. No one can console him. 2 Samuel 12, 18, we read it earlier that the child died on the seventh day. Seven days old. When you think about what David would go through, and I, I'm trying to be, you know, I want to be very appropriate, but when David was looking at Bathsheba and lusting at, ba lusting at Bathsheba and then committed the act of adultery, that emotion was so fast and gone. Fast forward ahead now to the emotion that is on him with this grieving, not only of the child dying, but the grieving of his sin. You see, Satan never shows us the end result. 
The temporary fulfillment of sin is just that, temporary. And it doesn't bring any fulfillment. The consequences of that sinful choice numb us and we can be spiritually lifeless. 1 Timothy 5, 6, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Isn't that a powerful verse? Wow, what a convicting verse. And then let her be a nameless child. A nameless child. Thankfully, David knew that one day he would see this child again. First, Second Samuel 12, 23, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I challenge you tonight in the in just in this close, whatever, and maybe maybe, you know, maybe everything's right with God between you and God. That's between you and God. But I can just say this. If, 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 the, if the snowball tonight is just this little piece of snowball, but it's already rolled up, and it's already moving, crush it. Ask the Lord to help you. Crush it. If it's a softball, crush it with the Lord's help. Don't let it roll down the hill. Because once that thing gets out of control, it's just running over everything in its path. Destruction. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, I don't want to end with that statement because I'm so thankful that we have a merciful God. I'm so thankful that we have a loving God who even when I go astray, he's praying, he's waiting, just like the father for the prodigal son. He's standing out there waiting for me to come home. When I come home, he puts his arms around me. He welcomes me back. Thankful for the mercy of God tonight. Let's pray together.